Hey friends, my name is Fernie and I'm the pastor here at Mid-City Church. I want to welcome you to worship today. I am so glad that you are worshiping. Uh, I really do take it to heart. Uh, there is a hundred other things that you could be doing, but you chose to be here. So I really appreciate that. I want to give you just a few instructions before we get started with worship. So on the top right of your, of your screen, uh, you will see a couple of links, uh, a couple of tabs actually. Um, I, want to, I, want you to, I want to point your attention to them. So the first one is a connection tab. And if you click on that, it'll take you to a connect card. If this is your first time worshiping with us, I really want to encourage you to, to click on that, fill that out. It's going to ask you for your name, your email, I think a phone number. Um, it's going to tell you a little bit about small groups, and it'll give you an opportunity to submit a prayer request. We really want to know who worshiped with us. So uh, whether this is your first time or hundredth time, uh, please uh, consider um, clicking on that and filling out a connect card. The other thing I want you to know about is to the right of that, it says give. And I really want to encourage you to consider supporting the ministry here at Mid-City Church. There's a lot going on, uh, especially in the next couple weeks. There's a lot that's happening next year, and we already have in the works. And I am just so excited for what's happening. And, I, and so I want to encourage you to consider supporting the ministry here at Mid-City Church. And, and even uh, for those of you who have given, I want to encourage you to continue giving. And just thank you for your generosity. Well, today I'm going to share a message uh, that talks about um, the promise that is found in the coming birth of Christ. And, and when we believe that promise, the, the fact uh, about how it should make a change within our lives. I know that sounds confusing, but I hope it's enough of a cliffhanger uh, to keep you uh, um, interested for the sermon. So I want to thank you for joining us and get ready because worship begins now. At every beginning, there is a yearning for the one who is coming. O oh, Emmanuel, open us to your presence. We gather together to allow our deeply held hopes to be reshaped by God's promises. O oh, Emmanuel, open us to your presence. We wait for the day when God will make for us a future that is no longer predicated on our fear. O oh, Emmanuel, open us to your presence. We find a new receptivity within us that desires God's will over our own will and relies on God's justice and mercy to accomplish it. O oh, Emmanuel, open us to your presence. Jesus, we welcome your presence now with the lighting of these candles, whose flames bring warmth to winter and fill this place with the glow of hope. Amen.
I will never forget the day that I met my wife, Susie. We were in Kansas City for a Young Preachers Conference, and uh, we, um, I met some of my best friends from seminary there. So Kyle was there, Austin was there, and my friend Mallory took her two coworkers, Susie and her friend uh, Roxy. And so we all met up in Kansas City, and uh, the night before the conference started, we had dinner at my friend Kyle's house, and we were eating dinner, we were hanging out, and all of a sudden, Susie went and started playing with uh, Kyle's dog, Bo, who's a big German shepherd puppy, I mean, huge dog. And Susie was just playing with this dog, and she looked so happy, and, and she, just, like, she, like, she, was, she was just full of joy. And there was something about her that made me want to go, who is that? Who is she, right? Like, I started asking all these questions in my mind about her. Well, the next day, we, uh, uh, after the conference, we went to dinner, and uh, I sat across the table from her, and I started getting to know her a little bit more and asking her more questions. And uh, after we left uh, that night, I started messaging her on Facebook, and, and uh, I'm guessing she must have felt the same way because, uh, you know, soon after that, a couple months after that, we started dating. Eventually, she moved down to Louisiana, and now we're married, and uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. But I'll never forget uh, sitting in Kyle's living room, uh, watching Susie play with this big German shepherd and asking, who are you? Who is she? In our scripture today, we meet a guy named John who is asked the same question, who are you? And, and I know it's not the, uh, in a romantic manner that he's asked that question, but there is something about him, something about the way he's living life, about something that he just exudes in living life that, that catches people's attention. So much so that a whole bunch of people begin to ask, who are you? I want you to listen to this text. It comes from John chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. This is a testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites uh, from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it. And he confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John says this, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees or by the Pharisees, and they asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his handle. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Over and over and over and over again, John has asked this question, who are you? They know that there is something different about him. They see that there is something uh, special about him, but they can't figure out what it is. So in verse 20, after they've asked him who he is multiple times, he says, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Elijah. I'm not even the prophet. I am here simply to point people to Jesus. I am none of those things. I'm here to point people to Jesus. See, I think there was something special about John because uh, I think John understood who Jesus was and what Jesus was doing. And because he understood that, he lived in such a way that uh, exuded uh, something different than everybody else. People saw something in John. People noticed something different in John and that came from him knowing who Jesus was and knowing what Jesus was about to do. See, I think John knew exactly, without any doubt, that Jesus was coming to defeat all things and, 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 uh, and to make sure that everything that is dark and broken was completely defeated. Let me say that again. I think John knew that Jesus was coming to defeat all things dark and broken once and for all. And because he knew that, 
because he knew what Jesus was about to do, what he, because he knew that the coming of Jesus was going to change everything, because he knew that, he lived with a sense of hope and grace that was just different from everybody else. And the reality is, since we too know what the life of Jesus means for us, since we as Christians know what the life of Jesus means for us, we too are called to live the same way that John lived, exuding a different kind of something that the world doesn't seem to have. See, on December 24th, we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And with that birth, we believe that God broke through and won the ultimate victory against all things that are dark and broken, that, that he won all things against evil and sin. Light has entered into the darkness and won over it through Jesus. All things broken have been put back together. And here's the beautiful thing about Jesus that we as Christians know. Not only has Jesus won the ultimate victory, nothing can overturn that victory. There is nothing that can make Jesus' victory go away. Nothing. Friends, sin, evil, darkness, worry, fear, anxiety, depression, brokenness, all of it has already lost to Jesus. Now, isn't that something that should change our lives? Something that should make us live a little bit differently? Something that people should look at us because we know that and people say, who are you? What do you know? But for some reason, we don't live like that. For some reason, I don't know why, for some reason we don't exude confidence that Jesus has already defeated all things, that Jesus has already defeated all things dark and broken. Instead, we tend to live our lives trying to win a battle that Jesus has already won. But let's be honest, that's kind of pointless, isn't it? It's kind of pointless to try to win a fight, to try to win a war that Jesus has already won. Now look, I'm not pointing the finger at you. I'm, I'm guilty of doing the same thing myself. I look at the world at times and think there is just way too much darkness and brokenness for me to fix it, Jesus. How can I defeat darkness and brokenness, right? How can I create enough light within me to shine in the darkness that I see everywhere, right? When, when I pray and when I talk to God, I say, God, how can I put myself together in such a way that uh, brings good news and redemption to the world, right? Uh, but uh, here's the thing. I am not called to fight those battles. Jesus has already won that fight. Jesus has already won that fight. Friends, Jesus has already brought light into the darkness. Jesus has already restored all brokenness. Jesus has already defeated sin and evil. Jesus has already won. So why do we live our lives thinking that we have to defeat this enemy? Why do we live our lives thinking that we have a war to fight, that we're losing somehow? You see, we weren't created to fight all things dark and broken. We were created to live knowing that all things dark and broken have been defeated. Jesus and Jesus' birth and Jesus' life, Jesus isn't calling us to take on the burden of defeating sin and evil. Jesus is calling us to live knowing that sin and evil has already been defeated. And that's a huge contrast. It's a huge contrast to live in this mindset of uh, we have to defeat evil. We have to win this victory. We, we have to fight. Otherwise, Jesus and good are going to lose. That's different, and that's, that's, that's not the right way of living. What, what we're being called to do is to live in such a way that we know without a doubt Jesus has won. Evil, sin, darkness, brokenness, it has all been defeated See, I think what John understood and what made John stand out to everybody was that he stopped fighting a war that had already been won. See, instead, John was living life knowing that victory was his, knowing that, that all things broken and dark was done. And in living in such a way, he exuded something that 
Nobody else seemed to exude. In knowing that Jesus had won, he lived his life in such a way that made people around him say, who are you? What do you know? What is it about you that is different? See, we are called to live in such a way that exudes uh, this, this promise of God's victory over sin and death. And in so doing, we begin to exude the same type of it, whatever it is, that John exuded at the beginning of our scripture. I learned this week of a a World War II prisoner of war in Germany. Uh, He was also a chaplain to American soldiers named uh, Murdo McDonald. And this is what uh, it said about him uh, on the day that he learned that Normandy had been invaded. It says, early on D-Day, he was awakened and told that a Scotsman in the British uh, prisoner of war camp, which was next door, wanted to see him. MacDonald ran to the barbed wire that separated the two camps. The Scot, who was in touch with BBC by underground radio, spoke two words in Gaelic, meaning they have come. MacDonald then ran back to the American camp and spread the news, they have come, they have come. And everyone knew at that moment that the Allied troops had landed in Normandy. The reaction, says, was incredible. Men jumped and shouted, hugged each other, even rolled on the ground. Outwardly, they were still captives, but inwardly, they knew they were free. See, they were all prisoners after D-Day happened. They were all still waiting to be released, but they knew that their victory was imminent. And and simply knowing that victory was imminent completely changed everything for them. Knowing that victory was imminent, all of a sudden they started rejoicing and they started finding hope and they started living life differently. And here's what I find very fascinating. Even though the war didn't end for about another year later, in that moment when they knew victory was imminent, they stopped being prisoners. In their hearts, They were no longer captive. Their future was finally secure, and they began to treat one another with kindness and compassion and generosity and care. See, this victory that they heard about on D-Day was imminent, that it was imminent that they were about to experience victory, that they were about to be released from captivity. And just knowing that that was imminent changed their lives, completely turned their lives, completely changed their outlook on life. So I want you to think about this. Jesus' victory is not imminent. It's already happened. Jesus has already won the war against sin and evil, against all things dark and broken, and nothing can change that. Now, if knowing that victory is soon to come can change everything for the allied forces, imagine how much more the good news that Jesus has already won should change our lives. Imagine how much more we should be transformed by the fact that Jesus has already won the war against all things dark and broken. Friends, if an imminent victory can change these these prisoners of war so much, how much more should we be changed by the fact that Jesus has already won? See, Advent is a time when we celebrate not only the coming birth of Jesus, but it's also a time uh, that that we remember that through that baby, we're going to experience ultimate victory. And if we believe it, if we believe that victory is already ours, then we begin to live out that victory and, and we begin to invite others into that victory. See, I think that's what John understood at the beginning of this gospel. I think John uh, knew that Jesus was here to bring victory, knew that victory was imminent, knew that things were about to change. And because he knew that, he began to, to live life a little bit differently, to exude a hope and grace and peace and love in a way that nobody else seemed to do. See, John knew who Jesus was and what Jesus was doing. He knew that victory was imminent In fact, he knew victory was theirs. So he cooperated with what God was doing. He pointed others to Jesus. He believed 
who Jesus was and began to live differently because of it. Friends, darkness, brokenness, evil, sin, it has all been defeated. And because of that, we are being to cooperate with God. To cooperate in, 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 with God so that um, in that process, we can point others to Jesus. See, if we truly believe, if we truly wholeheartedly believe that Jesus has offered us victory, that Jesus has defeated all things, then that good news should change us. And if that good news changes us, then, then I know without a doubt that people will begin to ask, who are they? Who are those people that live life a little bit differently? Who are those people that, that, that uh, seem to know something that the rest of us don't know, who seem to have hope and grace and peace and love and compassion and kindness and generosity and care in a way that nobody else seems to have? Friends, I pray that this Advent season... I pray uh, that as we prepare for this coming birth of Christ, I pray that we may not just know that this, this coming birth uh, um, is a reflection of God's victory. I pray that we may know that God's victory is here and now. And because of it, because Jesus has defeated all things dark and broken, we are being called to live life a little bit differently to exude God's grace and peace and love. And so this Advent season, I hope uh, not only that we may be uh, filled with the promise of God's victory, I hope that we may begin to live in such a way that others begin to ask, who are you? Because I want to be a part of that. Who are you? Because I want to experience what they are experiencing. Friends, may we be an example to the world. May we shine God's victory into the world. May it be so. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. God, as we await and prepare this coming birth, remind us that this birth brings us victory. That this birth defeats evil and sin and death that this birth changes everything for us. So God, I pray, I pray that this Advent season, this good news of your victory may, may dwell in our hearts so brightly and so loud that when the world looks at us, they may see Jesus that by believing your victory and owning your victory, that others may be pointed and led to Jesus. God, we just give you thanks. And we pray this in your most precious and most glorious name. Amen.
where you find him So lay down your burdens And breathe in forgiveness If you need freedom yeah, He's where you find him Oh, if you need freedom Well, hey, I just want to, I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope that um, worship, like every single week, uh, challenged you a little bit. I want to give you one quick announcement too, actually. So next week, we're going to experience a uh, music Sunday, and you'll get to listen to a whole bunch of music and scripture being read, and and I'm very excited for it. It'll be a little bit different than what you're used to. I also want to encourage you to to, uh, consider supporting the ministry here at Mid-City Church by, by giving financially, and so you can do that in one of two ways. Uh, you can go to our website, www.midcity.church give, or text give, G-I-V-E, to 225-307-0662. And when you do that, you'll get a text back that, with a link to our giving page. Well, I, I really hope that, uh, I, I, well, I said it a million times in my sermon that Jesus has defeated sin and evil that Jesus has defeated all things broken and dark, that, that, that uh, Jesus has won. And I hope I said it enough times that you can at least begin to believe it today. And if you believe it, friends, I hope that that, uh, that truth begins to change something within you. Because when that change begins to happen, we begin to point people to Jesus. And this Advent season, that's what we're called to do. To, to fully believe the good news of this coming birth and in so doing, point people to Jesus. I want to thank you for joining us. And remember, I love you, God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time.